16. You there? So I wanted to, we, we, every time we do communion, sometimes I talk about communion, sometimes I don't. So today I do want to teach about communion. I want to teach about the blood. The blood, the blood, the blood. There's nothing but the blood, nothing like the blood. I feel like putting my fist up. The blood, the blood, the blood. <clears throat> so Mark chapter 16, verse 1, says this. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought sir, uh, spices that they may come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was, I stress, who was crucified. He is risen. Jesus is alive. <clears throat> I'm going to say that again. Jesus is alive. Whether you believe it or not, you need to know that Jesus is alive. Amen? He's risen from the dead, and he's alive. Now, some would say, well, that's great for Jesus. Hooray for Jesus. Good for you, Jesus. You're alive. The thing is, what does it mean to you? What did his resurrection mean? mean for us you see he didn't do it for himself he conquered death hell and the grave and sin for us not for himself i completely identify myself with his crucifixion i died with christ amen i know you died with christ right i've if you've died with christ you've also risen with him and I identify with that resurrection life. Now that's, see, that's the difference with our church is that's where I stress and I teach from that point. From his victory. We take people to the cross, tell them they've been crucified with Christ. They need to submit. They need to surrender to the cross. Galatians 2 says that we've been crucified with Christ and the life that we now live it's not our life anymore. The life that we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God. Amen? So the life that I now live, I live because I identify with His crucifixion, and I live it in the resurrection. Amen? So don't get stuck at the cross. You know, move be and I'm not saying move beyond it as forget it. Always remember it. Know that you've been crucified. When that old flesh starts acting up, know I've been crucified. Know that you're a dead man. Does that make sense? I've died. You're looking, at, you're looking at a dead man. I'm a dead man walking. Because I'm a new man. The new man is in Christ, and he's alive. And so that's, that's my strong suit, what I preach the most, because I believe we need to hear that the most. Amen? And listen, when I sin, I go back to the cross. I ask for forgiveness. I commit it to the cross. I never forget the cross. It's part of my life. It's because of the cross. It's who I am. But praise God, I've got resurrection life in me. Amen? And that resurrection is how I live today. I live every day with a revelation that Jesus is alive. And because he lives, I live. Because he's alive, I'm alive. Because he's alive, I can face tomorrow. Amen? And so that's a revelation that everybody, the church, needs. Listen, the, the non-believer needs to know the cross. The believer needs to know the resurrection. Does that make sense? Thank you for one amen. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. So his, his death meant something to us, and his resurrection means something to us. He did it for us. Now, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. I'm getting to the blood. We're going to talk about the blood today. Romans chapter 3. This is where we're going to hit the blood. Romans chapter 3, verse 21. <clears throat> Whoo! Praise the Lord. But Peter says, man, we are a peculiar people. 
We are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Why? Because God wants, Ephesians 3 says God wants to manifest his glory to the world through the church. You need to know that. God wants to use you to manifest his glory to the world. That's what he picked the Jews to do, and they rebelled against him. And so what he did is he said, all right, Jews, you're on hold for a minute. I'm going to the Gentiles. And then Ephesians 3, he says that he wants to show his manifested glory to the world through the church. All right, Romans 3, verse 21, you there? It says this, But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed. So he says, this is it, it's apart from the law. He says, this has nothing to do with the law. The law is just dead. The law kills, the spirit gives life. And he says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, ready, to all and on all who believe. Do you believe? Yeah. Say, I believe. I believe. If you don't, say, oh my. I, did I hear an oh my? We'll have to slap you. I will come down off this pulpit and slap you if you said, oh my. So listen, it says, here's the righteousness of God. It's through faith, through faith. The Old Testament was works. New Testament is faith. In the Old Testament, works created faith. The New Testament, faith creates works. Does that make sense? So I do works because of my faith. Different topic in James. But notice here it says, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Ready? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every one of us. There's no one excluded. I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. Even Mary, the mother of Jesus, she sinned and she, fall, she falls short of the glory of God. Everybody does. Anybody who is born falls short of the glory of God. All have sinned, except for Jesus, of course. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. Say that with me. Propitiation. So underline that word. Propitiation is one of those 29-cent words that you say in a, you know, in, in, in a room and no one else has ever heard the word and you seem so smart because you can say it, propitiation, without spitting. But propitiation is key to everything we're about to go into. So underline that word, propitiation. I'm going to read it again. Whom God set forth. Who did God set forth? Jesus Christ. God set Jesus forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. Man. Now, 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 let me get into this for a minute. Let me get into the word propitiation for a minute. Let me give you a definition. Propitiation is an ancient English word, and it comes from the word propitiate. The word propitiate means to appease. Okay? So the word propitiate means to appease. The word propitiation means to appease by a sacrifice to a holy God. In other words, there's a God who is requiring a sacrifice for man's sin. That's propitiation. Uh, have you ever seen uh, the movie King Kong? One of the old ones, right? Uh, so King Kong would come out, rawr, you know, ooh, 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 ooh. He, he used to come out, rawr. and what did they do? They'd have to give him a human sacrifice, right? So he wouldn't eat everybody else up. So that human sacrifice, what was the name, Fay Ray? Fay Ray would be tied again in the trees, right? And he'd come and he'd eat her, well, you know, the sacrifice, and she became the propitiation for the villagers. Huh? The sacrifice. So King Kong wouldn't eat the village. So she became the propitiation. Now, Jesus, it says, became the propitiation for us because a holy God was going to consume everybody. Because we all fall short 
we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so God required a sacrifice to make him happy. Now, that's a bad word to use, to appease his holiness. How's that? Got it? He just doesn't want people killing themselves to make him happy. That's not, he's, that's not a kind of God he is. But he says, I require a sacrifice for man's sin. And he showed them that throughout the whole, whole Old Testament. Now, ready for this? You ready? You strapped in? All right. So the word propitiation in Greek, you better thank your lucky stars your pastor is Greek. Because, man, it's going to change everything that you've ever heard of the word propitiation or the blood. And Jesus. The Greek word is elastidion. And the Greek word, for all you Greeks, you ready to jump? Anybody, I got my Greek sister back there too. You guys ready to jump? So the Greek does not mean to appease. The Greek does not mean anything like that. The Greek literally means mercy seat. The Greek literally means mercy seat. So what it's saying is this, that whom God set forth as a mercy seat. It says, who God set forth that Jesus Christ is the mercy seat of God. Oh, this is going to change you. I guarantee it's going to change you. <coughs> it changes everything. So it's saying this, that Jesus, God made Jesus to be a mercy seat. He is the mercy seat of God. How? Through faith in his blood, we declare him as mercy seat. Now, that may mean nothing to you yet, but let's go back to the Old Testament to figure this out. All right? Exodus chapter 25. Now, if you remember what the mercy seat was in the Old Testament, it was the Ark of the Covenant, right? You know, the box, right? Indiana Jones, right? They went looking for the Ark of the Covenant, and they had two angels uh, on it, right, with their wings like this, both in each way. And the middle, the middle of that, when the high priest sprinkled blood on the covenant, that became the mercy seat. In other words, the mercy seat is where we find mercy, is where we find forgiveness. Exodus 25, you there? You sure? All right, it's all white. Exodus 25. So let's look at the Old Testament for a minute. I, I, it'll make sense to you if it doesn't make sense yet. Mercy. We need mercy, people. And you need to show mercy. Exodus 25, let's go to verse, well, not, we'll start 19, well, the, here, verse 17. Let's do that. You shall make a mercy seat, it says, of pure gold. Two and a half cubits shall be its length and a cubit and a half its width. So he goes through and gives him specifics on how to make this mercy seat. Verse 21. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. Watch this. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you, which are the Ten Commandments, right? And a couple of the, the Aaron's rod that budded in the showbread. And there, ready? And there. And there. Where? Where? At the mercy seat. Where? At the mercy seat. Listen. And he says this. God says this. And at the mercy seat, I will meet with you. And I will speak with you. Let me say that again. He says, and there I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. So listen, so, you know, a lot of people are trying to get a hold of God, right? People wanted to speak to God in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, and God says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. He says, the only place you can meet with me is at the mercy seat. He says, that's where man and God meet. He says this, listen, he says, that's the only place we'll meet, and it's the only place I'll speak to you. You try and come to me outside of the mercy seat and speak to the hand because the face ain't listening. <laughs> yeah. 
New Testament, Jesus is the mercy seat. Kind of putting it together. He says, that's where we'll meet, right at the mercy seat. Now, let me say this. In order for there to be a mercy seat, there are three things that are required. Number one, there has to be a place, like an altar. Number one, write this down because we're going to hit it at the very end. Number one, there has to be a place or an altar. Was there one? The Ark of the Covenant was it, right? Number two, there had to be blood. And number three, there had to be a victim. Where do you get the blood without the victim? Or how about, let me put it this way. There had to be a place, there had to be a victim, and there had to be blood from the victim. How many of you ever heard of satanic rituals where they cut chickens' heads off and they use chicken blood, like in Santeria? They use chicken blood on the altar to appease the God. Okay? So God, they got that from God. God required that from the very beginning. Why? Because when man sinned, God had to kill a lamb and cover them with, with, you know, you know what I mean. They had to cover them, so God had to kill. The shedding of blood had to cover man's sin. And he said, from now on, he says, the only place we'll meet is at the mercy seat. Because of your sin, you don't try and bypass the mercy seat. In other words, this, you cannot go to God outside of Jesus Christ. Jesus said he is. He's declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. What is he saying? He says, I'm the mercy seat, people. You want to find mercy? He says, come to me. You want to find grace? Come to me. You want to find God? Come to me. Jesus is the only way. And so here in the Old Testament, he goes, you want to meet with me, you meet me at the mercy seat. Now, how many of you have an iPhone? So, I, I, you know, Janice gets on me sometimes because my phone rings and I don't answer. I look at it, and I, I'll talk to them later. She's like, you know your phone's ringing. I said, I know. She goes, you know who to see? I know. She goes, well, aren't you going to answer it? I'll call them back. So there's a wonderful feature, not that, that I'm, I'm, you know, running away from people, but... <laughs> But there's a wonderful feature on the iPhone that when you call, you can hit a button and then text messages pop up. Everybody see that? So the one that I like to use the most is, I'm in a meeting, what's up? <laughs> I customize that. Because you can customize your own. You can hit it, it gives them a text. I don't have to answer the phone. See, now you know. Ah! Now you know! So I, I've decided I'm going to change one of them for the church people. And I'm going to say, I'm at the mercy seat. <laughs> I'm in a meeting with God. I'll call you back. <laughs> so that way you'll know I'm, I'm, I'm interceding on your behalf. I'm, pr I'm meeting with God just because of you. <laughs> so God says, you want a meeting? Meet me at the mercy seat. Everybody good with that? All right, go over to, let's see, where am I? Go over to, um, go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. So as you're going there, let me, uh, oh, go, go to John chapter 20. So, so let me, I forgot something real important here. The Hebrew word for I will meet with you, what we just said in Exodus 25, the Hebrew word, ready, is commune. So God says this, he says, I will commune with you at the mercy seat. Communion. God says, I will commune, I'll have communion with, me, with you at the mercy seat. To commune means what? Communicate. You ever hear the word communicate? It means, but the word commune means to speak intimately. That's what it means in English. To commune, in the dictionary, to commune means to communicate intimately. Okay, so God says this, he goes, at communion, there's going to be a communion, he says, where we're going to communicate intimately, where we will have fellowship. He says, this is where we will meet. So let me say this to you, okay, 
It says, remember what we said in the New Testament, that it was about the blood, right? He says, through faith in his blood, he becomes a propitiation, right? So the moment you declare his blood, the moment you have faith in the blood, the moment you speak about the blood, you sing about the blood, what does that do? God says, I'll be right there. Faith in the blood is anywhere you are. Old Testament was a physical place. New Testament is a spiritual place. Where? In your heart. So when we declare the blood, God says, I'm there. We're meeting. He communes with you the moment you exercise faith in the blood. Here's why I say that. So I got an atheist friend who knows the Bible inside and out. And every now and then we'll argue. I haven't argued with him in a while because, you know, it's like I don't feel like arguing anymore. And so why he reads the Bible every day? Why doesn't it make sense? Why doesn't it open up his eyes? Why? Because the only way he can meet with God is if he has faith in the blood. In other words, he reads this. Without faith in the blood, he never meets God. He'll never see God without faith in the blood. So I say that to say this. Don't, no, don't, don't get so, so religious where you read the Bible, you read the Bible. Oh, God, I don't know. You know, I still feel the same. I just read the whole Bible and I still feel the same. You're not going to meet with God unless you realize, thank you, Father, for the blood. And it's because of the blood, this is alive. When you exercise faith in the blood, then you meet God in here. Then this begins to explode like, wow, wow, I didn't know that, wow. Then you get this. See, you, can never, you cannot meet God and not know it. You cannot meet God and leave the same. And so people get real religious about reading this. They get real religious about praying. They get real religious about going to church. Listen, listen, I'm trying to help you. You can come to church every Sunday. It doesn't make you a better Christian. And you don't change unless you declare the blood. And I have faith in the blood. Because when I have faith in the blood, I go to church because Jesus died for me. I've been crucified with Christ. He shed his blood. And I'm here for him and him only. I'm not here for you. I'm here for him. <clears throat> when you do that, you come expecting and God says, I'll meet with you. I'll commune with you, and I'll change you. Does that make sense? So don't stop reading. Don't stop going to church. Don't get religious about it. Declare the blood. The blood. All right, John chapter, what did I say? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Everybody good? All right, John chapter 20. Look at this. <clears throat> we still got time, right? You're not, you're not rushing to go anywhere. There's no, are there any Russians in here? Just, just a, that was just a stupid joke. Arr, 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 arr. Oh. Help him, Lord. The Russian dressing. John chapter 20, verse 15. Ready? Watch this. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead? Uh, Jesus, verse 15. John 20, verse 15. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? <clears throat> she supposing him to be the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not touch me. He says, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to the brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. The reason why he said, don't touch me is because he hadn't entered into the holy of holies to pour his blood on the mercy seat. Remember, you need a place, you need a victim, and you need blood. He was the victim, it was his blood, and he had to take it into the Holy of Holies, into the throne room of God, and pour himself out on the mercy seat. The moment he did that, it opened up everything for us. Hebrews chapter 9. You still with me? Hebrews chapter 9. Let's make more sense out of this. Hebrews chapter 9. So he said, don't touch me. Why? Because a touch from her or anyone would have tainted the blood. And his blood was holy. Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> Ready? Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 11. Everybody getting this? All right. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. 
Hebrews 9, verse 11, it says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once. Say once. He did it so good, it only had to do it once. Once was enough. He said, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption, verse 14, he says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? Verse 24, ready? For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into, the pre but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for who? For us. Remember when I said Jesus is alive, hooray for Jesus? He didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it for himself. He was perfectly happy in heaven. He didn't have to come down here, become man, suffer at the hands of man, crucifixion, and all that nonsense. He didn't have to do it, but he did it for us. And it says this, that he entered back into heaven for us. Amen. Hooray for Jesus who did it for us. This blood was for you, he's saying. Now, he says, not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer once, often since the foundation of the world, and so on and so on and so on. So, here's the point. <laughs> Jesus entered in as the mercy seat. He is our mercy seat. Now, in communion, what do we have? Do we have the three elements? Well, we have sort of like an altar. We have his body, which is the victim. We have the blood, the cup, which is his blood. So right here, we can commune with God. God says, every time you declare the blood of Jesus, he says, I will communicate with you. Now, there is a term, and this is, I, I think I came all the way, that was an intro, just to get here. There is a term that we Pentecostal, charismatic, where to faith people use, and it's, I plead the blood of Jesus on you. You ever hear that? I plead the blood. And so sometimes we get real stupid with it because it's like a magical wand, you know, that I just plead the blood, you know. And then you hear people say that, and you're like, wait, don't diminish the blood. You don't use the blood like that. It's not a rabbit foot. You don't just plead the blood everywhere like that. The blood is where God and man meets. So when we say, I plead the blood, we declare it's a legal term. The word to plead means when, you, when you're in court, anybody ever have to plead? You know, the judge says, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? And so because of the blood, we can plead not guilty. He became guilty that we may become not guilty. So when his blood showed up on the mercy seat, God said, that's it. Tell them, tell them, for now on, they need to plead innocent, not guilty, because my son paid the price for it. And he says, and it's right here that I'll meet with them. If they try and come to me any other way, it's like filthy rags. That's why you cannot come to God in your own self, in your own righteousness, in your own works. Why? Because you're not a mercy seat. You never died for anybody. You are not a good victim, and your blood is no good to God. So we have to come through him, the real, true mercy seat of God. So in two days, we celebrate Independence Day.
In two days, we celebrate Independence Day, which is freedom. Because a man named George Washington and a bunch of brave men decided to go to war called the Revolutionary War. They decided to, to create a revolution against the Brits, the British. They went and they fought and they fought and they fought so we could be free. Well, 2,000 years ago, one man went to war for us and he made us free from sin and death and hell and he shed his blood to seal it forever and that blood, that blood still speaks today and it says, God, meet me right at the mercy seat. So when we declare the blood, when we sing about the blood, God says, that's right, my son fought a war, and he won for you, and let's meet right here. You're free. He says, he's free. He fought a revolutionary war. Jesus fought a revolutionary war, and for us, we need a revelation that he's alive. And he is the mercy seat of God. So listen, when I declare Jesus is alive, he's my Lord, he's my Savior, I declare him as the mercy seat. And, and then all of a sudden, the Father, me, the Father and Jesus meet right there in the middle with Jesus being my communicator. He's my sacrifice. He was the victim, and it was because of his blood. Amen? Amen. So you want to get changed? You know, I'm not saying read your Bible, but read it with the blood in mind. You want to pray? Pray with the blood in mind. You want to worship? Worship with the blood in mind. Lord, I thank you for the blood. Thank you, Lord. And today, Jesus says you do this often. Why? Because it reminds us that he is the mercy seat. This is the altar. This represents the victim, and this represents his blood. We call it communion because God said, that's where I'll meet you. You want to have a meeting with God this morning? When we do this, we are meeting with God. Lay down all your troubles. When the devil comes and tries to fight you and accuse you, I plead the blood of Jesus over me. When he starts to remind you of your past, I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind, over my past. I'm a devil. You're talking about a dead man. Jesus fought the war, and he won a revolutionary war. And because of that, every day is Independence Day. <laughs> 